Hello and welcome everyone to my talk. So I'm Bhaskar Raichaudhary and I would be speaking on, on the existence of competitive equilibrium with chores. This is joint work with Jogal Kirk, Peter McLaughlin and Ruta Mehta, all from University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Okay, so the talk would be concerned regarding allocations in the exchange model. So the exchange model is a fundamental economic model that is built on the barter system where a set of agents exchange a set of items among themselves fairly and efficiently. So this involves like agents maximizing their utility while exchanging goods and minimizing their disutility while exchanging bads or chores. And I would make the settings more formal and explicit as the talk progresses. So first, let me start uh, with the exchange setting with goods, also commonly known as exchange markets, which is a concept that's been there since the 19th century from the time of Leon Walrus. And here we have a set of agents and a set of divisible goods. So these divisible goods means that they can be fractionally allocated. And each agent comes to their, comes to the market owning a set of goods. And each agent, as I said before, at the high level picture is that these set of agents want to exchange their goods with the other agents and maximize their utility. So let me make it a little bit more formal. So given set of agents and set of divisible goods, our goal is to find the so-called competitive equilibrium. So by that, I mean that we need to find prices for the goods such that each agent sells her set of goods that she owns, earns some amount of money, and then uses this money to buy a set of chores that maximize her utility, okay? But this activity that is like earning money by selling the goods and then using that to maximize her utility can be done at any price vector. What's so special about a competitive equilibrium vector is that while each agent does this activity, while each agent maximizes her own utility, in this process, all the goods are sold. So basically demand equals supply, as a result of which these are also called market clearing prices. Okay, so as they are defined right now in this slide, it's not very clear that such prices always exist, no matter how many agents, goods, and what kind of utility functions the agents have. And here I would like to mention one of the most seminal results in mathematical economics, uh, thanks to uh, Arrow, Debreu, and also independently by Lionel McKenzie, who proved the existence of competitive equilibrium under certain mild assumptions. So these mild assumptions will also become explicit as the talk progresses. But just to mention that such prices and allocations do exist in a very generic setting. But uh, most of this talk would not be on the exchange markets and exchange market with goods because most of the existential and computational questions here have been answered. So what we would be focusing on is the exchange setting with chores, which has been relatively understudied. So in the exchange setting with chores, again, there are a set of agents who come with owning a set of chores to be done and they exchange it with each other so as to minimize their disutility. For instance, a set of university students teaching each other courses in order to minimize the time and effort required for learning. At a large scale, for instance, uh, time banks are such reciprocal service exchange platforms that can that do implement this. So in a time bank, so time bank is essentially formed by a set of individuals from a community. So each individual offers services to other individuals in the community and in the process earns due time credits. Then the individual uses these time credits in order to get services from other agents in the community. So this is this. Uh, so the whole idea of time credits can be more formalized and can be made much more efficient through the notion of competitive equilibrium. And that can be seen as an application of most of the results that I would be presenting at this talk. So let me formalize now the setting, the exchange setting with chores. So we have a set of agents, we have a set of divisible chores, and each agent has some initial endowment of chores captured by the endowment matrix, WIW. The IG at entry of this matrix signifies how much amount of chore J is owned by agent I. And then, as I said, each agent have their own disutility function signifying the cost or the pain incurred by the agent when they're allocated a particular bundle of chores. So since we are dealing with divisible chores, an allocation can be represented as an M or a bundle, a chore set to an agent can be represented as an M dimensional vector where the Jth component represents how much amount of chore J is being allocated. And once you feed this vector to the disutility function, it outputs a value which signifies the disutility or the pain incurred. 
Throughout the talk, we make a stronger assumption that disutility functions, that is of linearity. So if I give you an allocation, if I give you a chore set, so let's say y1, y2 up to ym, the disutility in code can be written, written as summation of dij, yj, where each dij indicates the disutility incurred by agent j per unit of chore j. Uh, and as you can see, the set of permissible values for dij, we do permit an infinity value. So what this signifies is that agent i cannot be allocated the chore j as agent i does not have the required set of skills to do the chore. So basically it says that, so dij equals infinity means that this chore j cannot be allocated to agent i. Anyway, so we have agents, we have chores and endowments and disutility functions, and our goal is to find a competitive equilibrium. So now I would extend the concept of a competitive equilibrium from the good setting. So through a small example, so let's say we have say a set of two agents, A1 and A2, set of two chores, C1 and C2. Agent one owns, owns the chore, all of chore two, that is C2, and A2 owns all of C1. And the disutility is captured by the matrix on the left-hand side. If you look at it closely, I mean, it's clear what should be done in this exchange setting. Agent 1 and agent 2 have very high disutility for the chores they own, but less disutility for each other's chores. So a natural thing to do is to just exchange the chores in order to minimize the disutility. Now I'll show you exactly this happening through the notion of a competitive equilibrium. Okay, so extending this concept of equilibrium from goods, the goal is to determine prices at P and an allocation X. So at this prices, each agent earns money, which is equal to the total price of the chores that she owns. And she earns this money by minimizing her disutility. So let me make this clear in this example. So as I said, agent one here owns all of chore two. So at a given price vector, P1 and P2, say the price of chore two is P2, then agent one needs to earn P2 dollars of money such that she can get this chore done she can, she, she, she can she, in a way, you can think of it as the time credit. So it, she, uh, agent one needs to earn P2 dollars of time credits in order to get the chore that she has done. And how will she earn this P2 dollars of money? She will earn it by doing a set of chores that she's comfortable with. Or in other ways, she earns this money of P2 by doing the set of chores that minimizes her disutility at these prices. So as I said, so each agent I earns their endowment money, just summation of J, W, I, J, P, J, by doing the set of chores that minimize their disutility. But as said in the goods case, this, I mean, each agent can have this optimal bundle of chores defined at any prices. But what's so special about the competitive equilibrium prices is, while well, each agent uh, consumes only their optimal chores, in this process, all the chores are allocated. So demand equals supply. So in this, uh, in this example that we have, so one such price could be say $1 of money each for chore one and chore two. So agent one earns $1 of money by doing chore one entirely. And agent two earns $1 of money by doing chore two entirely. So in a way, what essentially is happening is that the agents are exchanging the, their chores. But I've explained it through the concept of a competitive equilibrium. And this is the concept, this is the most efficient way to exchange chores when there are more number of agents and more number of chores with, with very complicated uh, disut disut heterogeneous disutility functions. Okay, so now that we have explained the concept of a competitive equilibrium, like in the goods case, the first question is that does a competitive equilibrium always exist? And as I said, that I would promise you what these mild assumptions are under which the competitive equilibrium exists in the goods case, we'll see that similar assumptions are required in the chore setting as well. So in general, a competitive equilibrium may not exist. A very simple example being the following where we have three sets of agents, one, two, and three. So agents one and two bring half units of chore one and chore two each, and agent three brings one unit of chore three. And the problem here is that agents one and two are only interested in chore one, while agent three is interested in chores two and three. So if you think about it, like at any competitive equilibrium, agents one and two Let's say P1, P2, P3 are the prices of C1, C2, and C3. At any competitive equilibrium, agents one and two need to earn P1 plus P2 dollars of money together only from C1, right? So they need to earn P1 plus P2 dollars of money by doing chore C1, which can only give them a maximum payment of P1. 
So as a result of which, it implies that the price of chore two should be zero. And if the price of chore two is zero, then agent three will not do chore two because it is not, I mean, it cannot be a part of the optimum bundle of the agent of agent three because he will not earn any amount of money by doing chore two. He will only incur this utility. So it doesn't make any sense for him to do chore two. As a result of which chore two will remain unallocated and undone. And therefore competitive equilibrium will not exist. So the primary problem here, if you think about it, is that if you have any set of agents who are only interested in a strict subset of chores they own, then you can never find a competitive equilibrium, right? Because they, I mean, these agents cannot exchange because they are only interested in a strict subset of chores that they are interested in. So there is no room for exchange here. Okay. So then this is naturally the first condition that we would like to propose that in an instance, there exists no subset of agents that can only do a strict subset of chores that they own. And in fact, this is a necessary and sufficient condition for existence of competitive equilibrium in the exchange setting with goods when agents have quasi concave utilities. Also note that this, is, this condition is polynomial time verifiable. Now, the natural question to ask is that, is this a necessary and sufficient condition in the exchange settings with chores as well? And unfortunately, the answer is no. So let me explain it through a small example. So consider this setting where you have again two agents and two chores, and both agents one and two own half units of C1 and C2 each. So you can see that this satisfies the condition one because each agent has, uh, I mean, ha owns some part of every chore. So that you cannot find a set of agents who are only interested in a strict subset of chores that they own. However, this instance will not admit a competitive equilibrium. So let me make it clear why. So let's say that like we want to find prices P1 and P2, and then a, both the agents need to earn P1 plus P2 divided by $2 of money by doing chores that minimize their disutility. So first of all, observe that agent one will earn P1 plus P2 divided by $2 of money only from chore one, because this is the only chore that he's capable of doing. And this would imply that the prices of these two chores are the same, P1 equals P2. However, if P1 equals P2, then agent two will not do chore two, because both these chores have the same price, while the disutility per unit of chore is, is less for P1. In fact, agent two will only do chore two if the price of chore two is at least two times the price of chore one. As a result of which, chore two will remain unallocated, undone, and competitive equilibrium therefore will not exist here. So even though it satisfies uh, condition one. So then we ask, well, are there any polynomial time verifiable necessary and sufficient conditions to check the existence of competitive equilibrium? May not be similar to the goods case, but something else. And unfortunately not. This is the first main result of our paper where we showed that checking the existence of competitive equilibrium in the exchange setting with chores is NP hard. So therefore the best thing that we can hope for is polynomial time verifiable sufficient conditions, which are simple, natural, and capture interesting instances. So first I would try to address these sufficient conditions and then we would try to settle the existence of competitive equilibria under these sufficient conditions for the rest of the talk. Okay, so let's look back at the example that we had where which rendered competitive equilibrium not to exist. So I claim that the problematic edges are the edges from A1 to C2 or A2 to C1. Because if you look at it carefully, if both these edges are present, then a competitive equilibrium exists. If none of these edges are present, even then a competitive equilibrium exists. It's only in the case when one of these edges exists that the existence of competitive equilibrium depends on the disutility values. So this, I mean, so this thing can be generalized. So essentially what I'm trying to say is think of the situation where the disutility graph of our instance is a disjoint union of biclicks, where the disutility graph is a bipartite graph with the set of agents and the set of chores. And there's an edge from an agent to a chore if this chore is a finite disutility towards this agent. So if our disutility graph is a set of, uh, is a disjoint union of biclicks, in that case, can we say something about the existence? And it turns out that we indeed can. And this is the second main result of our paper where we show that yes, indeed in these settings, competitive equilibrium exists. I mean, on instances that satisfy both conditions one and two. While condition two might 
seem to be restrictive, it is necessary because we show that if you if that if the disutility graph is even just one edge away from being a disjoint union of bicliques, meaning that if it has even one component, I mean, which is just I mean, which just is which, which is just one edge away from being a biclique. Even in that case, a competitive equilibrium may not exist. So it is. I mean, it's quite unavoidable unless you want to formulate conditions which exactly depend on the disutility values. Okay, so that's why I mean that's why we want to keep things simple. So we we want something to be dependent only on the disutility graph and not on the exact disutility values. The latter can be an interesting question, but that would be for future research. Okay, so now the question is that how do we prove the existence of competitive equilibrium on instances that satisfy conditions one and two, and that would what and that would be what I would be doing in the rest of the talk. So to this end, I would first introduce some preliminaries that we would require. Those are the fixed point theorems because these are also essential. These these were essentially the tools that were used to show the existence of competitive equilibrium even in the good setting. The most basic and the fundamental fixed point theorem being that of the Bravers fixed point theorem, which says that any continuous function which maps a convex and compact subspace of a Euclidean space to itself will admit a fixed point. I mean, I guess most of us are familiar with this fixed point theorem. So I would move to the next one, which is a generalization of the Brouwer's fixed point theorem for uh, correspondences or set valued functions. So for a correspondence where basically one element in the set S could be mapped to several elements in the set S, uh, we can have a fixed point if the following conditions are satisfied. So if the set S, like before, is convex and compact, if the set uh, phi of S is non-empty, convex and compact, the set of values that S can be mapped to by the correspondence is non-empty, convex and compact, and phi has a closed graph. So closed graph is essentially, uh, I mean, and uh, generalizing the notion of continuity to correspondences. It's like upper uh, upper hemi-continuous functions. So I will not be, uh, I mean, I will not be saying the details of what upper hemi-continuity is. I mean, just this much information would suffice for the rest of the talk. So if you have a correspondence which satisfies these three conditions, then it would admit a fixed point, meaning that there exists a point S such that S is contained in phi of S. So this is called Kakutani's fixed point theorem, and that's all that we need to know. So first I would show you the proof of existence uh, for the goods case. And then we would see what are the challenges that we face when we try to extend this proof of existence and how we overcome these challenges. So uh, at a high level for the proof of the goods case, a correspondence is defined on the domain of prices and allocations. And then we show that any fixed point of this correspondence will correspond to a competitive equilibrium. And then we show that this correspondence satisfies the conditions in Kakutani's fixed point theorem, thereby it would admit a fixed point, which would then imply the existence of a competitive equilibrium. So I'll just make this point a little bit more uh, clear with the slides. So our domain of prices is a simplex domain of prices. So each each price is a non, so each good has a non-negative price and the sum of prices of the goods equals one. So this is our domain of prices. Our allocation is this domain is a space of bounded allocations where each xij indicates amount of good j that can be allocated to agent i. This is not this variable xij is non-negative and it is upper bounded by a finite sufficiently large scalar m. So P and X are our domain of price and domain of allocations respectively. And our correspondence is, de uh, is defined on the Cartesian product of P and X. So now let me define this correspondence. So given a price P and an allocation X, the phi of PX is, contains all P prime X prime such that the following conditions are satisfied. The first thing is that if you look at allocation X prime and if you look at X prime I, which is like X prime I1, X prime I2 up to X prime IM, basically the bundle that is allocated to agent I. It is the optimum bundle for this agent at the price P. Okay. So in X, so in X, so in X prime, yeah, X prime I is the optimum bundle for, for each agent I at the price P. And then to tell you how the prices are modified. So I need to define this notion of an excess demand. So given the allocation X, you look at the total consumption of a particular good J. 
So which is captured by summation of X i j over all i. And then you look at the excess consumption. So if any particular good is consumed extra, then we say that this is a good in demand. Okay, so R j captures the excess demand or in a way the excess consumption of the good uh, under the allocation X. And what what the what the the, the way the fixed point theorem the way the correspondent modifies the prices is extremely natural. So it looks at the goods which are in demand and it increases their prices. So each PJ first we increase it by PJ plus RJ and then we renormalize it such that the P such that the vector P prime belongs to the simplex again. Okay, so this is exactly how the correspondence is defined. And now let me quickly tell you why a fixed point of this correspondence will give you a competitive equilibrium. So first of all, observe that any at any fixed point, so let's say p comma x is contained in phi of p comma x, then every edge. So if you look at every xi, so every xi is the optimal is the optimum bundle for agent i at the prices p. So every agent is allocated their optimal bundle of chores. Okay, so it suffices to show that all the chores are allocated. So this is the only thing that I need to show. So assume that there, assume that there is some, so, and this is the crucial part of the proof. So assume that there is some chore J, which is over allocated. A symmetric argument would follow for the case when there is a chore which is under allocated. So assume that there exists a J where summation XIJ is strictly larger than one. Then we can show that there exists a good J prime, which is under allocated, where summation XIJ prime is strictly less than one. And this follows from the fact that the total money of the agents equals to the total price of the goods. I mean, if you if you work around this, then you can you can show this kind of a rule. You, you can show the following impl implication. And this would imply that if you look at P prime J divided by P prime J prime, it's essentially PJ plus RJ divided by PJ prime plus RJ prime. But the fact here is that RJ is strictly positive because chore J is over consumed and RJ prime is zero because chore J prime is under consumed as a result of which this is strictly larger than PJ divided by PJ prime, which is a contradiction because we are considering a fixed point. We should have P prime equals P. So therefore, uh, at a fixed point, we should have summation xij equals one for all the chores. So fixed point would correspond to a competitive equilibrium. And then it is not that hard to show that the correspondence defined satisfies the properties that we showed in Kakutani's fixed point theorem. And thereby using Kakutani's fixed point theorem, there exists a fixed point, which then implies the existence of a competitive equilibrium in the exchange setting with goods. Okay, so this was more or less to give you an idea of how to show the existence of how the existence of competitive equilibrium was shown in the good setting. And now we try to generalize this approach for the chores and I will tell you the cru crucial difficulty that we would encounter. So like earlier we like we define five, I mean, we def the domain of prices and the domain of allocations remain the same and we try to define phi of p comma x to be all p prime x prime such that each agent gets their optimum bundle in X prime. I mean, each X, X, X prime I is the optimum bundle of agent I at prices P. And then similar to the excess demand for goods, you define the excess supply for the chore. So for each chore J, you look at the amount of chore J that is still, uh, be, is still left undone. Namely, you look at one minus summation of XIJ. So summation of XIJ, uh, overall I for a chore J shows how much amount of this chore has been completed. And you look at one minus, this is how much amount of this chore still left to be done. So you look at the excess supply or the amount of chore J that is left undone. And then you do something intuitive. You increase the prices of the chores that are still left undone. Because yeah, if you increase the prices, these chores will become more attractive and other agents will be interested to do these chores. So P prime J is defined as PJ plus RJ, then you again renormalize. Very similar to the defining the correspondence for the goods case. However, the main problem here is in the definition of this optimum bundle set. So this optimum bundle set would be empty for certain prices or certain feasible prices. For instance, consider this simple instance where there are two agents A1 and A2, A1 owns C2 completely, and A2 owns C1 completely, and uh, A1 is only interested in chore one, and A2 is only interested in chore two. By interested, I mean they can only do these chores. And consider this price vector where C1 has price zero and C2 has price one. Note that this is a feasible price vector. Um, 
And here, I would say that the optimum demand bundle for A1 is empty. Why? Because in any optimum demand bundle, A1 needs to earn $1 of money by doing some amount of C1, right? Because it's the only chore that he's capable of doing. And it's not possible to earn any money by doing any amount of C1 because C1 has price zero. So as a result of which the optimum demand set for agent one under these prices is empty. So this is the problem uh, when you try to generalize the approach for the goods. And to circumvent this issue, we change the domain of prices. The problem is that we should not allow such prices. I mean, we, and for that, we enforce one more condition. So now we have all the prices that belong to the simplex, but with one more linear constraint, which says that you look at every component of your disutility graph. Recall that we are working under the assumption that our disutility graph is a disjoint union of by clicks. So you look at every by click here. And here I, I enforce that the total uh, the, 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 the total um, endowment cost of the agents or the sum of prices of the chores owned by the agents in this component equals the sum of prices of the chores in the component. You, I mean, you can, you can verify here that such a price vector here will not fall into this new domain that I have defined here. So this is our fix. And here, for instance, if let's say the price of all the chores that an agent is interested in is zero, then the budget of the, then the sum of prices of the chores that this agent owns will also be zero. So as a result of which this agent needs to earn zero amount of money by doing some set of chores and therefore not doing any chores is a feasible allocation. So the optimum bundle is still well defined. This is how we circumvent this issue of infi or of B of empty optimal bundle sets. Okay. So now let me rephrase what, what we need to find. So now the problem is that since we have made our price domain more involved, we need uh, a correspondence which satisfies similar properties to what was before, but it should map from this more involved price domain to the price domain. So this is, this is the main technical uh, uh, challenge that we still need to resolve. So in particular, we want, so like, let's say P prime X prime belongs to phi of P comma X. So we want as usual X prime I to belong to the optimum bundle set of agent I at prices P. And then we want P prime to belong to P. And for each component of the disutility graph, we need something like P prime J divided by P prime J prime equals PJ plus RJ divided by PJ prime plus RJ prime, because using this similar to the goods case, we can argue about that, argue that any fixed point of the correspondence will correspond to a competitive equilibrium. So we need such a property. Uh, but the thing is we need such a property and we also need P prime to belong to the, the, the new price domain. And also we need that phi of P comma X is non-empty convex and compact so that we can apply Kakutani's fixed point theorem. So we need all these three properties. And that is what we show. Uh, that we show that yes, indeed, there exists a price vector which belongs to P and which, which satisfies these properties. And the set of such price vectors is indeed non-empty, convex, and compact. And uh, we show this and we prove the existence of such price vectors using Brouwer's fixed point theorem. Or in other words, we use Brouwer's fixed point theorem to show that there exists correspondences that satisfy the set of properties. And then, we use the Kakutani's fixed point theorem on such correspondence to show the existence of competitive equilibrium. So in a way, we are using a nested fixed point theorem to show the existence of competitive equilibrium in the exchange setting with chores. Okay, so that is more or less, I mean, there are still some challenges that you face while proving uh, continuity uh, with this more involved price domain and everything, but for the details, I would refer you to the paper, but. I just wanted to highlight the main takeaways from our paper and uh, for the purpose of this talk. Yeah, um, and with that, I would like to summarize. So to summarize, we initiated the study of competitive equilibrium in the exchange model with chores. And we saw that it behaves differently 
uh, from the competitive equilibrium in the exchange setting with goods, like to start off, it's NP hard to check the existence of competitive equilibrium, as opposed to the existence of a polynomial time verifiable necessary and sufficient conditions in the good setting. And then we showed that the competitive equilibrium exists in instances which satisfy, say, two conditions, which are simple conditions, namely, no subset of agents can only do a strict subset of chores they own, and the disutility graph of the instance is a disjoint union of bike works. And as for future directions, I guess the first question that follows is, since we have established the existence of competitive equilibrium using fixed point theorems, the question is, do we really need fixed point theorems to show existence? So like, uh, so that, that, that's the first, uh, first question that we would like to ask, that what is the complexity of finding competitive equilibrium under these sufficient conditions? So maybe it is PPAD hard, or does there exist a polynomial time algorithm then which would show a more elegant proof of existence? So apart from that, I guess we also would like to see what is the, can we show PPAD membership of finding competitive equilibrium under sufficient conditions? Because all evidences of using fixed point theorems, and also we can argue about rationality of the competitive equilibrium, all evidences show that yes, probably this problem at least is in PPAD. So can we come up with uh, fixed point formulations with which we can show PPAD membership um, of this problem? And then, as I said earlier, to investigate the existence and, I mean, existential and computational questions of finding competitive equilibrium in the exchange settings under other interesting sufficient conditions. For instance, at least as far as the computation goes, I guess another interesting thing to look at is when uh, when all agents have, uh, say, say, say when, when there are no infinite distributivities. Say, for instance, when all chores, when all between any agent and chore, the distributivity is finite. In such a case, it's, it's, it's easy to show existence, but then, I mean, does the problem get easier? Maybe can we show, uh, can we show a polynomial time algorithm there? Or even is that PPAD hard? I mean, all of these are interesting questions. So with that, I guess I would like to conclude my talk and thank you for listening.